i ka na gëshia krisën thene na Italia. A i vogli i ku më gëmonët. Dë herë u nësë, u këhuj prapë penë tjetër, o unë o dete. Pa që a falë të qënë, pa hajtë të të nësë da hanë bukë hatë. Po ata që jo në jorit, jo në katër, dhe më thonë dy ata dy fëmit, katër e katër, të të veta. Në qërë të ufishin. Kërë është mune në kama, ata më mërë. Fëmitë, fëmitë e fëmive, një për dhe. Në qëshë e jo. Ajo më dhore ata më më dhe, e jetës një rikët. Kur ke i fmi të dhe letë është ka një ma mirë. Se nuk më shumë. Ana që... Ma dhe në mërë për të ripojtë. Kështu që ka thëmë për në jetë. Well, hello. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Good. Yes, good. Well, uh, welcome to the next uh, session of the, the um, of this uh, extremely interesting conference. And uh, thank you very much to everybody for organizing it and for um, being here. Um, I want to say um, actually how pleased I was. Uh, I've been working on this for like two years already. And uh, yesterday to hear um, Heiko Maas rep uh, um, actually referencing articles, uh, an article of mine in The Economist was extremely gratifying because it means actually that uh, people have uh, begun to take notice of this and that it's now no longer just a sort of uh, in thing of minor interest uh, academically and um, uh, journalistically. Um, it's great that we're talking about this. I've got the impression that uh, uh, we're a little bit skating around some of the problems. I mean, yes, this is a clearly a European problem. We're focusing, obviously, for the for good reason, on, on the Western Balkans. But I mean, the big question is clearly that this is a problem affecting the whole of Central and Eastern Europe and it affects Western Europe as well, uh, in the sense that uh, it's a serious problem if uh, the, the young and the skilled are decanting out of one half of Europe and going to the other half. Um, we've been talking about uh, freedom of movement and uh, of course that's important, but we have to uh, somehow discuss us also at some point uh, this other problem that uh, if freedom of movement means that one half of Europe has freely moved to the other half of Europe and that's clearly going to have um, political, economic and uh, social uh, problems. And the other thing that has only just been mentioned just a little bit on the side by uh, Francine Pickup was that uh, this question of uh, depopulation, youth moving, etc. Yes, it's important, but it's actually only one third of the problem. One part is emigration, the second part is uh, low fertility rates, and the third part is uh, uh, the lack of, of immigration. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to touch on all of those issues um, in this uh, panel, um, but um, we can at least uh, start, and we've got a very 
very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, my first, um, my first uh, panelist is uh, Michal Arandarenko, who's professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Belgrade. Um, it says, uh, Michal, in your biography that you've argued that governments in the region uh, tacitly support emigration. That was something that was uh, mentioned um, earlier on, because obviously it means uh, unemployment figures go down, remittances, etc., and because uh, you know, potentially troublesome people have, have, have gone away. Um, but do you think that maybe, and let's leave out the question of um, COVID for the moment, we'll, we'll come to that, come back to that, that while that might have been true in the past, that chapter is actually somehow coming to an end because now a bigger problem for governments are uh, labour shortages. So um, over to you. Okay, could you hear me now? Okay. I can hear you, yes, go ahead. Sure. Uh, clearly the, the scene is changing uh, in, throughout the Western Balkans and uh, labor shortages would, will perhaps uh, be the, uh, more pronounced in the decades to come. We have heard about, uh, uh, of course, the, the uh, demographic prospects for the region and some countries face, face a serious depopulation, of course. Uh, but uh, I would like to basically present how this uh, model works in its ideal simplified uh, uh, form, the model that I call the exit and loyalty political economy framework, of course, in about to uh, Albert uh, Hirschman, uh, whose uh, work on exit voice and loyalty is one of the, of the classics in, in uh, social sciences. Okay. So, uh, of course, this is a highly stylized, simplified picture that I will offer, but that's the case, of course, with all uh, models. So how that system that I call system of exit and loyalty and little or no voice reproduces itself. I'd like for the slide to be uh, to be presented now because I would make use of it. Could I, could, uh, could, uh, yes, sorry. Okay, fine. So this is that vicious circle of, next, next please. Yes. Uh, the vicious circle of remittances, inequality, and migration in the Western Balkans. And uh, let's start with something that is considered positive, and that is remittance uh, info. All Western Balkan countries actually have uh, remittances uh, of uh, around uh, about 5% of GDP and some close to 15 and more. So this is... Uh, uh, this qualifies them as labor exporting uh, countries, definitely. Uh, after, could you move to the right uh, side or keep it uh, simply so that the, the full slide is seen all the time, please? So when remittances enter the country, uh, they basically increase consumption and uh, they, because of the composition of the population that migrates, and that's uh, as stocks at least, that's not only young and educated, that, uh, that is a very mixed population. And many of them historically, and even now, uh, have been among the poor styles of, of society. So the consumption in, the countries that are sending is actually greater than the GDP that is being produced within the country. And also it facilitates the su suppression of poverty uh, because uh, poor people often uh, care about themselves by, by migrating. Another effect that I will not dwell very much is on uh, at, uh, currency appreciation. That's a sort of Dutch disease uh, effect when 
uh, which enables basically some of the countries to have uh, euro or effective euroization because there is always enough currency that comes uh, despite the negative trade balances that comes in terms of remittances. But then the adjustment does not stop there. The adjustment all also means that uh, the entire tax benefit and public expenditure system can uh, change thanks to the large inflow and stable in normal times inflow of remittances. Tax system uh, uh, is based on uh, consumption or indir indirect taxation, and it enables three out of six Western Balkan economies to basically have the levels of uh, government revenues and, and expenditures that are uh, about the European Union average and higher than most of the expenditures that you can see in, for example, Central and Eastern Europe. And that despite the large informal economy and despite uh, the, the, the fact that the employment rates, that the labor markets are actually quite weak. So what this also enables is the possibility to, uh, uh, for the government to uh, create a, a large public sector, which is well paid and which uh, in a way buys maximum loyalty among the population for the government through employment uh, in the public sector or through other, other channels. What does it mean? It means that the private sector becomes, le le becomes less important and uh, becomes crowded out in a way. So there is less um, space for genuine uh, entrepreneurship and work. And there is also rent seeking in public sector. So young people queue to get a job in the public sector uh, because that pays better and the chances of prospects through that political channels are better. This of course stalls economic growth and uh, the countries do not really catch up with the rest of Europe. Although they function as a, basically uh, as a stabilocracy says some, uh, some political scientists uh, say. And then this also means that, uh, uh, the, that, the, that the labor markets reproduce itself. Now we have demographic trends which uh, contribute to the depopulation, which contribute to the uh, reduction in unemployment. But actually employment does not really increase and especially good jobs do not increase. So for example, throughout the region, the, the wage differentials compared to the Central or uh, Western Europe remain the same. Uh, they do not uh, close uh, because of, uh, of, let's say, the, the improvements in labor market statistics. And then it means that there are more, that, that there is still more young people and other people who rely on migration as a means to improve their lives. And uh, I would say just because I, I don't have much time that, well, if I, I think this is one possible understanding of what's going on in, in the region. I wouldn't say that this is uh, extremely unstable, but one message that I would like uh, basically to, to convey is that if you look at uh, the remittance migration nexus in, in, in this way, uh, one can say the remittances are not as usually looked at the bright side of migration and that the migration is the good side, that, but rather that the picture, the overall picture is quite blurred and mixed and that migration for some uh, important parts of the population are actually is, is the way of uh, uh, social 
uh, advancement of, of improvement of their position, while remittances through this government channel have a negative uh, negative. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's um, well. It's uh, great that you managed to sort of demonstrate uh, uh, this sort of ambiguous uh, point of um, of, uh, of remittances. Um, there's something I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, which is that obviously we would love some questions, um, but please don't use the chat function. Uh, use the Q and A um, instead to send uh, your question. Okay. So now we're moving to Anita Richter, your senior policy analyst and project leader of Southeast European Regional, of the Southeast Europe Regional Program at the OECD in uh, Paris. Um, I know it's still too early to say, but nevertheless, what are your feelings about how COVID will have affected um, migration and fertility patterns. Um, how will things look when we uh, emerge from the pandemic? I mean, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but um, you do work for the OECD. So, um, you know, you're as well placed to guess as anybody else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I do not have a crystal ball. And neither anybody else from my colleagues at the OECD do, uh, do have uh, such a crystal ball. And I wish I would have it to fully give you an answer to this question. Uh, I think it is still way too early to make any uh, sound predictions on how things will move along the way. But nevertheless, I mean, uh, the OECD, we like to look at evidence at, uh, and to see what are the trends and to predict sort of the future. Certainly what we've seen um, very recently, also with the migration outlook that has been published by the OECD, it's a more of a global focus, but we can clearly see that already in, uh, in the 2000s, migration flows have dramatically dropped um, throughout this year. So compared to pre-COVID period in 2019, um, with the second wave that we are talking about, certainly um, with new lockdowns, etc., cetera, these uh, negative migration trends will continue, including um, uh, very likely also for, for the Western Balkans. How long this will take? Uh, when things will turn around, it's, um, it's, it's difficult to predict. Um, but nevertheless, um, we all are of the assumption that this will come to an end at, at some point. And then we have to see how the um, economic landscape will look like uh, globally, so including in the Western Balkans. Because um, the, the key question, and what we've been dis discussing all the time, the major migration push factor are the jobs. So it really will depend on how the global jobs landscape will look like in one year or two years or whenever from now. And what we already see in, in, the, in the year 2000, clearly um, GDP has been dropping. GDP has been dropping massively in, in, in the Balkans. We've seen up to uh, projected trends up to minus 12% in Montenegro for uh, Serbia is, is getting a bit better with only minus 3%, uh, but this is automatically affecting also um, the unemployment rates. Um, there are, that uh, traditionally have been much higher as compared to uh, OECD countries and OECD Europe countries. Um, you know, you, you know the figures are between 12, uh, 20% unemployment rates, which are, uh, more than double compared to the OECD. And we already see in 2020 that they are increasing as compared to 2019. On average, they're about 2% higher already, projected to be 2% higher in, um, in the Western Balkans. So, and the same figures, the same trends we see for the youth unemployment, which is even more pronounced, which is even much higher in a, in a massive problem. And it's mostly the youth that is uh, going abroad. So having said this, um, the trend is likely to continue once um, the flows of um, people, movement of people is, 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 is more easily guaranteed again. Um, it is certainly to expect that the economic impact of the COVID crisis will be even more severe than in the OECD countries, leaving a uh, less unfavorable um, economic job landscape in, in the Balkans. Um, meaning that uh, it's quite likely that 
um, there will be a new wave of migration flows towards um, OECD, uh, particularly also European countries, uh, will continue um, la later on. Um, another thing, besides COVID, um, one important aspect that I think we should also have in mind is um, that in parallel to COVID, which is uh, right now overshadowing the actual the fourth industrial revolution that we are in. I mean, it's still ongoing, especially it's even accelerating in the sense that uh, moving more to automation, moving, uh, inc uh, accelerating the digital transformation. And this um, in the future, I mean, there are also uh, some predictions that it will massively um, change the way we work, the types of jobs that would that will be um, globally in the Balkans, including. I mean, it's everything is uh, interconnected, and uh, so the questions that we, we heard about is digital nomads. So um, things that the way we work, the way where jobs will be, will totally change. So um, we've seen in the Balkans in the past years. Past ten years, there's been a lot of attraction on the automotive machinery sectors. So, with the um, high dependence on the European markets, um, the Europe, Europe as a trade partner, also these types of investments uh, will can change. These type of jobs might change, which will not only might release more people um, from the job market, looking then for other jobs um, elsewhere, and also redefining the type of work they are doing. Um, in, in the future. So it, these are really unprecedented times um, that will um, may bring things completely upside down um, anywhere, including in, in uh, the Balkans that have quickly to react to um, on the one hand side, on the migration flows, outflows, if the governments are eager to um, keep people because uh, skills is the one and key to actually um, develop your economies and uh, to adjust with the new um, economic landscape, societal landscape that we will have in, in a few years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for keeping that um, precise. I mean, it is obviously quite an alarming uh, picture. Um, and to, I mean, I've got some, some data here, which I'll quote, mm -hmm. which is, um, which kind of like reinforces what you're saying, but it's about remittances, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the latest data from Bulgaria, the data from the central bank is that remittances have decreased by 65% in 2020 so far. Um, and they are so far, according to the central bank in Bulgaria, 291.2 million euro compared to 836 million for the same period uh, mm -hmm. last year. So you know, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, and it also kind of kind of begs the question of, are the people in, people in the diaspora already losing their jobs? So maybe even though you're talking about sort of more people going to OECD countries, mm -hmm. uh, actually maybe there won't be jobs to go to in um, OECD countries. Um, well, but that remains to be seen. Okay, um, one other point is that I said earlier, please, um, don't ask questions in the chat function, but in the uh, Q&A function. Uh, but I'm reminded that you can also raise your hand. Uh, so, so there's a possibility that you can um, ask it uh, for real. Um, now we're going to um, uh, we're going to um, Edo Omic, your director at the Directorate for European Cooperation and Strategy at the Council of Europe uh, Development Bank, in. Um, in, uh, uh, in uh, Paris. Um, and a question I had for you is, well, I, you're working on human capital development in the region. Um, if people with skills from lorry drivers to surgeons emigrate from Western Balkan countries or Balkan countries, Southeastern European countries in general to Western European countries, um, that in the end represents a wealth transfer, doesn't it? From a poorer part of Europe to a, a richer part. Perhaps you could talk about some of the ideas that are out there to uh, balance freedom of movement with um, equity and sustainability. Yeah, sure. And thanks Tim and to the organizers for inviting us to this, uh, this conference. It's a really great opportunity. Also great to see a, a former colleague of mine, Anita, here from the OEC. So I knew the conversation was going to be at, at a high level. Um, no, we couldn't agree with you more. This is an area that we have been following very closely about the wealth transfer from uh, Western Balkans to the Western European countries. 
we would go even one step further and say that actually the economic dividends that these migrant workers generate in Western European countries come from years of investment in the education and healthcare sectors in the Western Balkans. Um, but instead of being uh, the economic dividends being realized in the Western Balkans, they're being uh, realized in, in Western Europe. So in effect, the Western European countries are fronting the bill, if you will, to develop part of the human capital that is being utilized in Western European countries. Um, and the question you bring about is, is how do we create more sustainable and equitable uh, transfer of that wealth transfer? And historically speaking, when we look at what's happening in the region, it, it typically comes in two forms. One is remittances, which has been discussed already, and the other is EU grant transfers and, and subsidies. Um, remittances, when we look at it from our standpoint as well, the, the real issue that we see here is that in half the countries, the trend has been uh, negative in half the, the Western Balkan countries, or it's stagnated or leveled off in the, other, in the other half. And for us, that points to a potential picture of, look, this might not be sustainable in the long term. It might not be guaranteed that remittances will stay here forever. Um, and we also agree with what, what Michal is saying. There are a lot of negative economic effects potentially with a high remittances uh, as percentage of GDP, and that can be real appreciation of the exchange rate to even pushing up the reservation wage within a country. But then the second area that, that we have seen that transfers happening is through the EU grants and so forth. Conceivably, one could argue that a migrant from the Western Balkans who is in Germany or in France is paying tax, which goes into a budget at the national level, which then feeds into EU budget, which then comes in the form of IPA financing and so forth that comes back into the EU or in the Western Balkan region. Now, from our perspective as a development bank, what we've seen is that most of that transfer of funds have been coming into hard infrastructure. And uh, as a result, governments and, and politicians in the region have been essentially incentivized to uh, put their money in, in invest in projects that are in things such as roads or in energy markets and so forth. Now, uh, that's extraordinarily important. And there's a need for EU grants and guarantees for such projects because this is important for the economic development of the region. But ultimately, that transfer can be more sustainable and more inclusive in the future if it's more devoted to the social sector. And here we think that historically speaking, very little has been devoted to things like education, healthcare, to help politicians incentivize them to invest in these more long-term projects. Um, and we are encouraged. The latest in, uh, investment plan for the Western Balkans published about a month ago does talk about this desire to push more into this, into this area, having an innovative agenda and so forth. Um, and so we, we think of it as a sense of that money to be utilized to invest in the education, healthcare sectors, and even to some degree housing and affordable housing. Um, if we take education as an example, uh, as one area where we think those transfers could really help, um, we agree that a certain group of people will always be leaving the region. So why not try to educate the largest pool of people that we possibly can in the region? Yes, some will leave, but then those who stay behind can help progress the economic models that are there and help transition to a more knowledge-based uh, economy. As Anita was rightly putting, there is a huge revolution occurring right now. And by our estimates, 60% of people who are employed currently in the Western Balkans are employed in sectors that are high risk of automation in, in the next uh, 15, 20 years. Um, so the solution obviously there is to invest more in better uh, educational systems. But when we look at the, the underlying figures, what we see is, is a relatively mixed bag and somewhat uh, of, a, of a negative picture. There has been in our opinion and through our analysis as well, a severe underinvestment in the education sector. And as a result, you will see that a large majority of schools in the Western Balkans will report that they have either a lack of materials, and this is things like books and computers, or a lack of qualified teachers. And they're some of the largest uh, deficiencies in the whole of Europe. And as a result, this is potentially contributing to the fact that students in the region are scoring amongst the lowest PISA scores by the OECD's work in the whole of Europe. Um, so if you want to develop a higher skilled workforce that's going to help transition towards the more human capital oriented future economy, you need a better education system and better investment. Another area that we see there's some deficiency is early childhood education. Here, it's a mixed bag. Some countries uh, are not providing as much formal early childhood education. And for our opinion, uh, and again, from the academic research and that's out there, uh, what we know is that the more you invest in early childhood education, the more you give kids the opportunities and the tools and the skills to be able to 
better utilize those skills for later educational outcomes and then generate better outcomes later on in life. And it can also diminish the educational inequalities that, that tend to exist between the rich and the poor. Um, there's also a second benefit that's really quite great about having more early child education as well in the region is that women will be able to potentially enter more into the labor force. Women in the region predominantly take on a large proportion of the domestic care responsibilities, uh, including childcare, of course. So when you have more early child education, it can potentially shift some women into the labor force. Uh, and let's be honest, one of the, the, the problems that we have in the region as well is that uh, female participation in the labor market is one, again, one of the lowest in Europe as well. And then finally, we go to this area of vocational educational training. Again, when we look at the region, what we see is that there is a low amount of investment and uptake of vocational education. And this is also correlated highly with a high level of underutilization or skills mismatch as well. And typically when we look at a whole plethora of countries, countries with more vocational education and opportunities tend to have lower issues of skills mismatch. In the Balkans, it's really in the opposite direction. Um, so here we think, again, further investment in vocational education could be a huge step to upskill existing labor, but also give young people who are coming out of the education system the potential to learn additional skills that the, the actual uh, business market requires. So this is just one area where we think some of that EU transfers could really help mobilize funds to create a better human capital situation that can create more inclusive economic growth. And we also look at other things, but I, I want to stop there because I'm probably running out of time. Um, uh, and the, sorry, but before we go on to um, Andrea, I just want to um, uh, ask you something. Uh, the, uh, that figure, could you just clarify that? Am I right? Because that you said 60% of jobs in Western Balkan countries today are basically a threat from automation um, and um, modernization. And it, did I understand that correctly? And if so, how does that compare with with uh, w with Western European countries, that that sixty percent figure. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's 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 uh, the the current sixty percent of the current people employed are employed in sectors that might be at risk of highly mobilization. Now it could be that not all of those sectors, all those jobs will be lost, but it's just that there's a higher risk in those in those sectors. When we compare it to Europe, I don't have the figures in front of me, but it is considerably lower. Of course, uh, for instance, if you take Germany, only about one point eight percent of the people in Germany are employed in the agricultural sector. Now, in the Western Balkan countries, that number can range from 30 to 50 percent of people are employed formally and informally in the agricultural sector. So that's just one area that is, uh, is potentially a, a, just a, to show how, how vast the differences are. Great. Well, I suspect that in um, a couple of years, we'll, we'll probably no longer be talking about deep population and demography, but this will be the, 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 the subject, especially when it comes to uh, Western Balkans. Uh, thank you for um, highlighting that. Um, we're now moving on to Andrea Michanovic, your youth representative of Montenegro in the governing board of uh, RICO. Uh, and you are in um, Podgorica, so um, over to you. Um, oh, and sorry, I'm supposed to ask you a question. I'm sorry, that, that's, that's why you're looking a bit stunned. And the first, sorry, I'm supposed to ask you a question. And, the, and what I was going to ask you was um, the way things, uh, had been going, at least until the beginning of the pandemic, was that um, Western Balkan countries were trapped in a catch-22, i.e. needing young and educated people in order to develop and converge with EU economies. Um, but until they're developed and, and richer, many young people uh, won't stick around to, um, to, to, to help countries uh, get Get to that point. I mean, this was something that was talked about a little bit about earlier in the conference. But um, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Are you going to stick around uh, in, in Montenegro to make it a, 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 a you know a rich and developed country, or are you thinking, I don't think I can wait my whole life to do that? Okay, so over to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for your question. And um, first of all, it's a great honor to be here today and to share my thoughts on such an important topic especially uh, uh, since I myself am a young person and I cannot say that I do not have dilemmas of whether to, uh, to stay in Montenegro and uh, um, keep bearing the burden of being a young person and therefore someone the society relies on or to leave and to join so many young people from Montenegro and other countries from the region that have uh, already left and uh, lost their faith. 
Um, coming to your question, um, for example, yesterday I uh, held a workshop uh, with um, around 20 high school students from Montenegro. And the aim of the workshop was to, to target the main challenges young people in Montenegro are facing and also to define potential solutions. Um, and everything was fine uh, uh, until the end when we were doing the, the checkout and the participants were expected to say how they felt it, uh, during the, the workshop and what the conclusions uh, from their side, uh, say, side um, uh, were. And there was a girl uh, who said, and I, I really quote now, um, she said, I feel really happy that I have met so many open-minded people today uh, who are engaged and are willing to contribute to, to the society uh, and to development of Montenegro. But at the same time, I'm um, also even more happy that in the next five years, majority of us will be living all across Europe or the world, but not in Montenegro. She made the joke and the others started to nod and to laugh. But I wish you could see their faces when they um, realized that, okay, it was a joke, but it's also the reality. Um, so, um, yes, I would say that young people in the Western Balkans are in a catch-22 because we are, it seems to me that we are constantly balancing, be, balancing between uh, um, our responsibility towards the society on one side and on the other uh, uh, between our need and our right to seek, uh, seek better somewhere else. And I have to admit that yesterday after the workshop, I felt um, a bit empty because I obviously uh, somehow failed in uh, uh, inspiring those young people to, to stay and to, to create and also then work on implementing a better vision for our society because they plan to live in the next five, five years uh, maximum. So I, yes, I invested my time, I invested my energy, uh, experience, my optimism and enthusiasm yesterday, uh, but then I'm not sure whether uh, uh, it will uh, uh, pay off and be profitable for the society in the long run. And if we move from that uh, um, individual contribution of, for example, me working with young people to uh, a national level of, for example, Montenegro, investing a considerable uh, amount of money every day into every young citizen, uh, um, then... Um, into every young citizen who will most probably uh, eventually leave the country, then I think that Montenegro's investment uh, in that sense um, is not profitable, which uh, is uh, one of the, in my opinion, uh, um, but still at the end of the day, I'm not the expert in the field, but I'm just a young person. But however, I feel that it's one of the uh, most negative effects of, the, uh, of youth emigrations from the Western Balkans uh, um, to uh, uh, developed countries. Um, so it seems to me that we can, for example, talk about Western Balkans region as a, um, let's say, uh, um, human capital export company. So on a daily basis, we are uh, uh, exporting uh, young people uh, to developed countries um, and we are doing it uh, for free. So our investment in those people who are leaving uh, isn't profitable in the, in the long run. So yes. I think that youth uh, migrations uh, um, is an issue that should be targeted by the governments of the uh, of the Western Balkan region. But then, what I think is the first step towards it is changing the the way uh, um, government officials and decision makers are perceiving young people, because uh, I feel that we are usually uh, perceived as um, as uh, those who belong to young generation whose time will come tomorrow rather than a valuable resource that really needs to be nurtured today. And I think that once we are seen as a, um, not as a problem, but as a part of the solution, I think that only then we have made the first step towards solving not only the issue of youth migrations, but also all the other issues that target uh, young people. So um, I would stop here for this first uh, intervention, intervention of mine. But I really hope that during the panel, I will have also a chance to talk about possible solutions for, for the problem of youth migrations, of course, from my perspective. So thank you. Th th thank, thank you very much for that. Um,
So now we're going to move to um, a session of uh, questions. I mean, I've got two, which I'll read out, but if anybody else has questions that you should um, put them in the Q and A uh, function um, or uh, just uh, raise your hand, uh, click the hand symbol. Um, we've got one from Irena Serovich who says, in terms of future readiness of labor markets in the Balkans, particularly in light of the crisis, but also the digital revolution, um, where would you suggest policymakers focus their attention. Um, and then there's a, a, another question. I think this is um, directed at Mihail. It says, um, maybe from maybe this circle from remittances to new migration also depends on the level of liquidity problems in the country of origin. Uh, where there's a real liquidity problem, the impact of remittances could be slightly better. What do you think? Uh, so um, Mihail, do you want to answer that one? Because that's specifically to you. And then maybe other people would like to um, come up to, 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 to answer um, Irena Serovich's question on the future readiness of uh, labor markets. Uh, yes, uh, that's one of the paradoxes of uh, remittances. When you need them the most, you get them the least. And uh, that happened uh, in the past economic crisis. Uh, uh, the, the countries in the region in, uh, in 28 to 2012, had a decrease in remittances because simply uh, people uh, could could not uh, come in large numbers to to the destination countries of Western Europe, and then uh, as the situation in the in Western Europe and increasingly in Central Europe improved, uh, because now there is a actually larger uh, uh, increase in. Uh, circular migrants to Central Europe than to Western Europe, where only Germany still accepts uh, uh, labor mig migrants in larger numbers. So then there was a, that uh, uh, you know phase in which uh, the economies of the region grew, but then they increasingly uh, faced the uh, shortages of workers who would, uh, in construction, for example, or in 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 uh, in uh, uh, health services and in care services who would go to Western Europe in good times. Now we have very bad times due to COVID and then at the same time there is a sudden stop in remittance inflow in the region. So they are basically remittances are pro-cyclical and they are not good stabilizers uh, as, as, as such. So that's basically another, another problem with them because they are you know, the, the, we always forget that there are two sides uh, to the migration problem. One is the readiness of uh, people from sending countries, for, from labor exporting countries, and another is readiness of, of um, uh, destination countries to accept them. And of course, now uh, the, that readiness or the demand for labor is shrinking everywhere. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, so who'd like to pick up the Irena Serovich's question, uh, which I'll just remind you, in terms of future readiness of labor markets in the Balkans, and in particularly in the light of the crisis, but also the digital revolution, where would you suggest policymakers focus their uh, uh, attention? Um, but I don't know who wants to pick that up first. Uh, Anita, why don't you, why don't you um, start with that one? Uh, sure. Um, well, looking at the labor markets, I mean, what we've seen is um, there is already a huge, well, the labor markets are hugely challenged in general in the, in the, in the Balkans. Uh, looking at the high, uh, high, high unemployment rates, which will increase um, in, in our point of view also in the future with, with the crisis. Um, in terms of the labor um, the, the kind of skills that is produced, I mean, already as Edo mentioned, um, the, the level of skills, the human capital that is produced through the educational system um, currently does not, uh, will not respond to the, um, the new, the changing um, job landscape in the future. Um, you've seen them through the PISA test and et cetera, et cetera, that in fact, actually the educational outcomes are rather decreasing, have been decreasing over the past few years. So there needs to be a lot of attention in order to increase the, um, 
the quality of education, first of all, in the Western Balkans. The secondly is, um, yes, to have a better um, match of the, um, the skills and the, and the labor market needs. Already, this is one of the biggest problems that um, the Western Balkans are facing. Um, the educated people do not have the right skills that are needed on, on the labor market. Um, the types of investors that are interested to come to the Balkans, they cannot find the right skills anymore. So there's a, and, and this has, is, I'm not telling anything new, the, the skills management has been a long-standing uh, recurrent issue for so many years. And, and we have not seen so much the, the government be very flexible and, and, and adjusting to that uh, problem very much. Secondly, um, now talking about uh, digital revolution, um, also looking at the digital infrastructure, the, um, the skills, digital skills, um, also companies using uh, digital means, e-commerce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's way below um, OECD averages, way below EU averages. So there's there's a massive gap along all these lines, um, which Balkans have to quickly actually catch up and to prepare just a, a reasonable basis to. Um, take part in, in this new um, area that we that we will having. Um, one last point, I mean, what we'll also see is um, that connects pretty much to, to the previous discussions is the type of skills that are uh, have been educated. And this is what probably um, young people will be looking at is, um, or when they make their decision on their educational um, specializations, you know, going to the health sector. But again, if they, if they decide to become a nurse or a doctor, et cetera, it's oftentimes also because they're attracted to go then abroad with their skills and don't use them where they're most needed in the Western Balkans. Similarly, even if uh, there will be a huge effort um, to increase digital skills of, of people and move more into in, uh, more technological innovation and in, in these kind of things. Um, we see a bit of this trend in, in Serbia, but not so much for the other countries. Um, we then again, will these skills be used in the Balkans or will people rather tend to apply those elsewhere because there are better job opportunities, etc. Thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, I was just a bit thrown because you uh, uh, froze the, the, in the, the last second. Um, before we go on to some more questions, I'm sorry, to, some more answers there. Um, I want to ask you whether in terms of um, education and preparing for automation, et cetera, et cetera, there's a significant difference between the Western Balkans, specifically the Western Balkans six, and uh, I know this is not an expression used very often, the Eastern Balkans, but basically, I mean, the EU countries of um, Bulgaria and, and, and Romania. I mean, are they basically in the same place or are they in a significantly different place when it comes to these these issues because um, obviously migration has been and, and demographic challenges have been um, equally severe in those countries, if not worse. I, I don't have a concrete data to compare the Balkans with the other three um, uh, countries that Southeastern European countries that are already a part of the EU. Um, but nevertheless, what is clear, they are, let um, me talk about Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, they are also below EU averages across all, um, all the lines um, in terms of digitalization. Um, and still there's a higher migration flow from those countries because again, uh, it's movement of people is, is more easily uh, for those countries. The jobs are that are um, opportunities elsewhere are more attractive, uh, salaries are more attractive, uh, social securities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, even as you're part of the um, EU, the, the pool factor to integrate and uh, migrate to another um, e European country, OECD country, um, pretty much remains the same and even gives more open doors to, to do so. Um, of course, then when you again compare the Balkans to those uh, three countries, I mean, South Europe, it's also Greece, of course, um, to, to look further. Um, they're still at the lower rate, they're still a um, a uh, huge gap between, um, and it's actually widening gap um, between the Western Balkans and let's say, let's call them rather the um, 
uh, Central, you know, Eastern European countries that have joined the EU uh, la later on. Um, so there's the gap is widening across all the lines and across of and in terms of wages, in terms of um, inequalities, in terms of um, yeah uh, digital outcomes. So. Um, in the first steps, the, the Balkans have a, need to undertake a huge effort to first close the gap with the other Southeast European, Eastern European countries from the EU, and then the, the EU levels are, of course, um, even, um, I wouldn't say light years away, but this is how it will feel. And, and sorry to give such an, a bit uh, grim outlook, but uh, there's a long way to go. Okay, thank thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, I'm I'm not going to ask the the the, the other other two uh, about this because actually there are um, specific questions to 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 you um, from uh, Friedrich Putman. There's a question specifically for you, Edo. To what extent does the COE, presumably COE Bank, consider? Um, actually, it just says this dilemma, and could it be that this is overlooked? I'm sorry. Now. Um, I'm suddenly realizing that um, I'm not quite sure which dilemma he is referring to because it says at the top, it says, thank you, Andrea, for pointing out this uh, crucial dilemma. Well, let's go to Andrea. Uh, it says a question for you. It says, what, if anything, would you recommend to mitigate the uncon unintended consequences of fostering emigration rather than local development through better education? Since um, it was you who brought up the dilemma, why don't you start? And then um, we'll go to Edda. So first of all, th thanks for the question. And um, there are a lot of uh, solutions I would suggest, but I would, will now uh, just list uh, some of them, uh, which I think are uh, the, the most urgent ones. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, lack of data is one of, uh, one of the first challenges that needs to be tackled uh, in order to, to solve the, the issue of good migrations. Because, um, I mean, I can speak for Montenegro, but it seems to me that I can also speak for other countries in the Western Balkans region. There are no official and relevant data on how many young people have left, uh, when they left, uh, why did they left, under which circumstance, circumstances uh, uh, would they come back, etc. And uh, only if we have uh, a relevant data uh, can we um, define uh, quality and productive strategy uh, uh, towards approaching this, this issue. Um, secondly, what I think uh, uh, is important and can be uh, a useful tool towards um, really encouraging young people to stay in their countries is uh, um, strengthening youth activism in the Western Balkan region. Because once you show a young person that he or she is important for the society, once you show me that I uh, can participate in decision-making processes, but not pro form, but rather uh, uh, to really participate and to directly uh, be able to, to create policies, I will also build a stronger connection then with my society. So in the long run, uh, the, the level of youth migrations uh, will decrease. And when, when I speak uh, about strengthening youth activism here, I really want to stress out that our governments should take uh, into uh, account uh, more um, young people with fewer opportunities. And here I really refer to young people from rural areas, young people with uh, disabilities, Roma youth, etc. Because I'm not sure uh, as someone working with young people how much they are into the focus of, of governments, not only when it comes to strengthening the youth activism, but also when it comes to, to solving uh, other uh, youth issues. Um, I also have to uh, uh, come back to education because I think that education is really a tool uh, uh, towards um, uh, raising awareness of a young person who can then more easily solve dilemmas such as this one, whether to, to, to leave or to stay. Um, in, in which terms, uh, coming back to, um, to what I was talking about at the beginning, uh, I really think that uh, the prevention of youth migration isn't only about economic integration um, and, and but that it really needs to be about regional educational and also scientific uh, cooperation uh, in a way that, for example, um, universities across Western Balkan region could, um, uh, let's say, especially the state ones, uh, offer uh, joint study programs uh, uh, at the bachelor or master level, or um, um, we could uh, think of something like Erasmus Plus, but, but within the region. 
so that young people can go to from one to another country uh, of the region for a semester or, or even a year. Uh, or to, to think about more uh, cooperation between the universities when it comes to, to uh, science and uh, uh, technology uh, researches, etc. Uh, and also uh, coming back to, to the last uh, question that we were uh, just shortly, uh, um, that we were talking about uh, previously, how to more connect uh, and prepare young people for the labor market. Um, as someone who's directly in, involved in the process of education, uh, as someone who's, let's say, consumer of education process in Montenegro, I think that it is uh, of utmost important that uh, um, we gain more pra practical knowledge in uh, within the, the edu education system. For example, I spent a semester uh, as an Erasmus Plus uh, exchange student in Ljubljana, so at the University uh, uh, of Ljubljana in Slovenia, and that was the first time I uh, um, was, I would say, confronted with the case law. It was the first time I uh, uh, held um, um, judgment from the European Court for Human Rights in my hands. Okay, I gained theoretical knowledge in Montenegro, but then uh, what's about uh, what about the practical one? So I think that also that uh, can uh, and should be targeted uh, by those uh, decision makers in the field of education. Um, so yes, and uh, what I would like to refer, but maybe later, is the negative narrative that is being served to young people that really needs to be uh, uh, to be uh, tackled in order to help young people and help me feel more welcomed in my region. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Edo, I don't know if you want to um, pick, pick that up. Um... Yeah, I mean, I can briefly kind of try to tackle a few of the, the questions that just emerged in the last, uh, the last half an hour or so. But um, I completely agree with everything that's been said thus far. We need further investment in, in more targeted uh, educational uh, capacity because the region is lagging behind. Um, I think an earlier question you had was how do, does Western Balkans compare to other countries that enter into EU after 2000 or, or in Croatia seven years ago? Um, we'll take one figure, for instance. Uh, I believe it was Romania. I have to check because we were, we're, we're going to be releasing a report, by the way, uh, in a, about a, a few weeks uh, in our initial findings in the Western Balkan investment framework, where we're actually analyzing what uh, are the, some of the social sector uh, components that are affecting the back brain drain in the region. And one of the things that we saw with uh, labor productivity is that these countries are just not catching up. Um, they're, they're, they're really lagging behind. Uh, if you look at Romania, for instance, in 2000, Romania's labor productivity as a percentage of European labor productivity was about 30%. Today, it's 70%. Uh, part of that is the fact that they've entered the EU, they've gotten a lot of transfers, there's now a, a more investment in higher productivity sectors as well. But in the Balkans, none. Are, are even near 60%. Most are uh, below 50%. And in the case of North Macedonia, Montenegro, for instance, labor productivity has actually shrunk. Now, part of that is labor shedding. There's about a bunch of people leaving. But what worries us from our economic analysis here is that there's also a uh, inequality component within the way education systems function in the region. Um, simply put, if you are from the most advantaged background possible in the region, on average, again, I'm going to refer to the OECD here, the OECD PISA score for someone in the highest income groups in the Balkans is equivalent of the average score of someone who is in the bottom 25% in Europe. So even if you're the best conditions, you're still not going to be able to achieve high, high returns because of the education system. Now, for the bottom 25% in society, that situation is just abysmal. It's horrible. They are, they are receiving the lowest outcomes in the region. So uh, really there also needs to be a focus on this inequality component within the education system as well. Great, well, that's um, pretty scary. Um, and well, I've got two questions which really um, pick up on, um, on, the, on things that both of you have been saying. So I'm, I'm gonna, they're, they're kind of different, but I'm going to read them um, both. Um, the first one is from Vlora Rechitsa. She says, Hi, everyone. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Democracy, IDSCS, although she doesn't actually tell us where, I'm sorry, um, and have just returned from my master's studies in the UK a little more than a month ago. The number one question since I've returned is why I returned, and if I couldn't find a way to stay in the UK. This shows that despite good economic standing, there are deeper issues that push us to leave our countries, including here, 
corruption, air pollution, quality of life, social values, political culture, etc. And these issues are much harder to address than economic ones. And my question is, how do we address emigration due to these reasons, which seem much more complicated and essential? I mean, we've we've talked about that in general terms already, and I think the whole conference has talked about that in, in general terms. But I mean, one thing that I would take from that is this question of, of uh, that, that somebody raised earlier of, I don't know whether, whether the right word is, is, is stigma, but uh, people automatically assuming that, um, that everything is a, a great uh, if, if you're abroad. Um, Andrea, I can see, see you shaking your head, so maybe that's something that you could, uh, you, you could talk about. Uh, to a question from, uh, from Remus Gabriel Angel, who's in Cluj in Romania, and um, Romania is one biggest expert on this question of immigration and demography. Um, and perhaps this is something that Edo, maybe you'd like to pick up, or Anita or, or Mihar. He goes, on the policy agenda, while the topics discussed generally address important topics targeting most of the people living in the Western Balkans, I'd like to learn more on what discussions think about the people in rural areas, what will be the future between migrating, migrating temporarily or stay, and the same for remittances and EU funds for uh, these people. So uh, for, first question is really about this um, psychological question, this stigma of like, you, know, you come back, you, you, wanna, you want to live at home, you want to work at home, uh, and you want to contribute to your country, and then people think that you've uh, failed. And, and this, I have to say, is, um, is something universal. This is not specific to the Western Balkans. I mean, two years ago, I went to uh, Niger on the uh, edge of the Sahara, and I met um, African migrants who were trying to get through Niger to Libya to uh, Europe. And a lot of people said, and that, you know, part of the problem was that I said, you know, you, you, could, you could end in Libya, you end up in a slave camp, and then you kind of die in the, could die in the Mediterranean. And people said, you know, once you've left, it's very difficult to go back because people think that you've, that you're just a failure. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a universal question. I mean, sure there are degrees, but uh, it's not just, a, a, a Balkan issue. But I don't know whether, um, Andrea, since um, you're the young person on the panel, whether you'd like to address that first, and then somebody else can pick up Remus Gabriela Angel's question about um, rural areas. So yes, I really agree uh, that um, there are a lot deeper issues that um, tend to uh, force us to leave our country, such as corruption, nepotism, uh, uh, political, lack of political culture, etc. Those are really huge issues, which we can see also through reports of the European Commission, for example, the one released uh, uh, recently regarding Montenegro. So um, I am, am not sure whether I would, uh, uh, would um, suggest and um, extremely new solution or something like that. But uh, what I think uh, is important is to strengthen non-formal education of young people because through the formal system of education, I have never heard about corruption. I have never heard how to how to fight corruption in the society. I have never heard uh, uh, about nepotism or uh, what political culture is, what which political skills uh, uh, I should gain as a young person. Uh, so that once I go voting, I really know uh, what my decision is based upon. Um, so um, I think that in that sense, non-formal education of young people uh, is, um, is important um, because um, if you have a, a, a socially aware young person, uh, then uh, you can, but who's at the end of the day uh, decided to stay in the country, then uh, you can also, I think, uh, fight even uh, even those um, issues such as corruption, nepotism, lack of political culture, and everything that you mentioned in the question. Uh, coming back to the neg negative narrative that I uh, mentioned previously, I also think that uh, a huge problem of our societies is uh, the negative narrative that is being served uh, to young people on uh, on a daily basis. For example, when I was uh, when I finished the high school, and uh, it was really hard for me to to choose what to study. But then it was hard, even harder for me to choose where to study, because it was hard to resist the pressure of the of the society, of my family members, of my professors, of my friends, who were keeping uh, who were keeping telling me, "Okay, you have to leave. 
uh, this country is not for you. Uh, the biggest success of a young person in Montenegro is to leave the country. I decided to stay. Um, and I cannot say that I uh, that right now I do not have uh, dilemmas of, as I said in the beginning, whether to leave or not. But up until now, I did not regret for my decision because I met so many, uh, um, so many uh, successful people, even in Montenegro, who succeeded without using any form of nepotism or corruption. But you know what's the problem from my perspective? That we rarely read about those young people in the media. We rarely hear about their stories uh, um, from uh, from the people we communicate with on a, on a daily basis. So. Um, the, the really negative image of, um, of our society is created uh, thanks to uh, not only media, but also to, uh, to all of us who are, uh, uh, as you, Tim, uh, said previously, assuming that somewhere else is uh, and has to be better than it, it, it is here. So um, what I think is that we need to hear uh, more about positive examples because, for example, my example or the example of someone that I know will, will inspire a third person to, to, to stand against the corruption or to stand against some, um, some other social problems that are really forcing us, uh, uh, really forcing us to leave the country. Um, right. mm -hmm. can, I, can I stop you there? Because actually we've got like loads of questions now beginning to okay. pour in. So I'm going to stop you there. Like, uh, who would like to pick up on the um, uh, uh, question of, um, uh, of rural areas uh, that um, was um, brought up by Remus Gabriel Angel? I, I can step in very quickly just to yeah, add a go ahead. I mean, here, one of the things that we've seen in, in our analysis is that uh, there is going to be this migration trend internally as well within these countries. Uh, and often we're seeing larger uh, population centers now, uh, urban centers also having larger and larger migration flows coming in there, putting further pressures on the already existing social services. Now we're all about the social, obviously at the Council of Europe. And here we, we think it's a real concern as well because you see it transformed in one particular element, which is affordable housing, for instance. Uh, more and more people are going into the urban centers. This is putting up increased pressure on housing prices. And as a result, people are having a hard time actually be able to afford even the, the basic uh, shelter components necessary for life. It's, it's becoming very difficult. So there is an area that also needs to understand is, is a huge concern. And then of course, by having more people in the city centers, you need to invest again, more in the necessary social services to be able to ensure not only education, but also healthcare. Um, healthcare is something that is not invested as appropriately as it should be in the region. It's underinvested as well. And poor people who are coming from rural areas uh, into urban areas where they don't have the same uh, incomes or they have not maybe gotten the jobs yet to, to obtain a higher level income will face challenges like higher out-of-pocket expenses in hospitals. Um, this will also create huge problems on their, on their ability to maintain themselves in the labor force in the long term. We, we've actually seen in our analysis that uh, because of their relatively low health outcomes, uh, people drop out of the labor force earlier in, in some of the countries in the region. And as a result, uh, you're looking at annually, based on our estimates, 275,000 years lost uh, because of pretty much uh, people are prematurely uh, dying or exiting the uh, labor markets. I mean, uh, l l let me be a bit provocative here. I mean, we saw the kind of tear jerking video at the beginning and the old people left behind in the villages and all that but in, you know in the big picture does it really matter I mean surely uh, Western Balkans are kind of um, Balkan countries uh, urbanizing and people leaving uh, rural areas is a continuation of a natural phenomenon which has been going on uh, for like a hundred years um, uh, and was, is, is, was just simply much more developed in, in, in Western, the Western part of Europe and it's just sort of a natural phenomenon and you know sad though it may be does, does it really matter on the, in, 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 in the long run uh, does somebody want to pick that up? You know, uh, Michal or, or Anita, maybe? And if not, I'm fine. I'm just making a comment, but I can go yeah. happily read on the next questions. Michal, does it matter? Uh, just to, uh, to provide a, a little bit more optimistic picture about the sort of uh, the future of rural Balkans, because uh, coming from Serbia and also uh, having a sort of uh, looked at uh, at the other regions of former Yugoslavia. Uh, I would say that actually 
the emigration uh, has had historically a bit of an emancipatory role uh, because throughout, you know, because you know the first wave of migrants was uh, from Yugoslavia that was mostly unskilled migrants uh, uh, working in manual jobs in Germany during 60s and 70s. So we have a lot of, uh, let's say, experience with what has happened with the uh, with, with the rural regions in, in Serbia. And it is not great, but uh, yes, there is a depopulation and uh, the internal migration to Belgrade. It is r really difficult to sort of uh, point out that the, that, that emigration wave, especially the, those from 60s, have contributed to sort of the devastation of rural areas. I would say that the, the, the picture is more nuanced and that actually uh, the, the Serbia and former Yugoslavia at that time uh, could not handle anymore the sort of rural population that it uh, intentionally left behind. You know, that was the sort of uh, uh, the, the first two and a half decades of so socialism in Serbia were the decades where people moved uh, uh, in, to, to urban centers and the villages were supposed to, you know, just industrialize or die. And uh, uh, this did not happen and the immigration actually helped them survive at a sort of, uh, at, at a much smaller base. And that's the metaphor or the way I look at the current depopulation wave, uh, even throughout the, the Western Balkans. Yes, we face uh, severe depopulation, some countries more than others. For example, Serbia uh, has managed pretty well uh, uh, so far. But in any case, there will be a certain point now that the sort of remittances and, uh, uh, and migration have that stabilizing uh, role that is not uh, helpful for development, but still, uh, there will be a certain point in the future where, you know, uh, this trend would uh, simply uh, uh, slow down and then possibly re revert. And of course, there is a lot of action that needs to be done, but one has to be very cautious in projecting, you know, in, in taking for granted, granted, for example, what we have heard, that there is a, there will be a 30% or 40% decrease in the population in 30 years. It does not go like that. And that's also the experience that I can basically draw uh, uh, regarding the rural areas in Serbia. And, and as I say, yeah, sure. Okay, that, that, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sort of conscious that um, time is actually beginning to run out, uh, uh, just when we're beginning to kind of really take off and get to the, to the meat of the matter. So uh, what I'm going to do now is, uh, although we could talk about the rural question much longer, I'm going to uh, accelerate a bit and I'm going to read you some of the uh, other questions which have come in. Uh, and then we don't have that much time, so I don't expect you to uh, pick up on um, all of them, but uh, at least we'll know what people are thinking. Uh, uh, G. Steinacker says, it's a matter of fact that the state is the biggest employer in all Western Balkan countries, as we've already said. What could the EU do so that Western Balkan countries take over more responsibility and accountability in this field? What's the reason for the failure of governments so far? Well, that's probably a whole panel in itself. Um, uh, Julian Prischka says, remittances decrease dra dramatically after 14 to 15 years that an immigrant leaves the country. Is there an estimation around the Balkans. Where are the Balkans at this moment concerning remittances? I don't know if anybody, the, Edo, you're shaking your head. So uh, that one, that one, you can answer that one. Um, Elizabeth Herberger says, uh, uh, Andrea, dear Andrea Michanovic, you say it has to be solutions that the older population does not understand, but you describe the consequences, but the core causes are deeper. Question, inequality, no social justice, unfair behavior on all levels, up to corruption. What do you suggest? And Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous attendee says, what about digital jobs coming to the Western Balkans? There are many digital workers from the region doing tasks for international online labor markets through platforms. Certainly the case in Serbia where, uh, um, 
USA and Canada are getting every year the best part of the high qualified people from Albania. Does the EU have a specific politics, politics to improve the possibility of these people at least not to leave the EU? Okay. And Falanza Podrimia, who I suspect is uh, from Kosovo, but doesn't say, says, oh, yes, she does. She says, Andrei Michanovic, you rightfully said that we need to show young people that they can have influence in policy making and decision making. Here in Kosovo, no one wants those young people to know about their. Uh, real power. Young people either try to leave or be part of the system. Any ideas on how we can educate them through the Western Balkans on their rights, duties and uh, possibilities? Well, that's it. So um, let us start. Um, Andrea, why don't we start with you? Because there was a couple for you there. Uh, and then uh, we will go to uh, everybody else. And, and then I think we're going to be coming to an end because we've got another 15 minutes left. So Andrea, um, over to you. Um, and I'll remind you that last question was from Falanza Podrimia from Kosovo. Uh, how should we educate people um, talking about um, influence in policy making? And the other question for you specifically uh, was inequality, no social justice, unfair behavior on all levels, up to corruption. What do you suggest? So quite brief, but over to okay. you. So the second question I think relates to what I was talking about previously. So I will just repeat that my opinion is that non-formal education of young people needs to be fostered so that we have socially aware um, young citizens who are um, willing to stand up uh, and stand against, against something that is not in order. When it comes to the question of Pelanza uh, um, um, coming from uh, Kosovo, um, it's a it's a hard question, but I would um, encourage all young people from the Western Balkans who stayed in their countries to uh, first of all be uh, um, an example to um, to their peers to show to to share their experience uh, on a daily basis and to um, not be discouraged if uh, uh, small steps are made during the day. For example, um, uh, coming back to the workshop that I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, intervention during this panel. Um, maybe a, a girl um, uh, who said that she will uh, uh, leave in the next five years is not the one who I um, succeeded uh, to, uh, to influence yesterday. But there are also some other young people who approached me after the, the, um, the workshop and asked me how they can uh, get more involved into, uh, um, in the organization that I was representing yesterday. So small steps can, in the long run, I guess, um, lead to really huge impact. And um, I think that, first of all, we young people um, need to be aware of the strength that we have so that then we can expect government officials and those decision makers to realize the same thing. Great. OK, thank you. Um, I'm coming now to uh, Anita. Um, I don't know if you noted down um, a question that you wanted to, to, to pick up. If you didn't, I, I can remind you of, of one. Actually, I was looking at this, uh, the question about the digital jobs coming to the Western Balkans from the anonymous entity. Um, if there's an, an, I think there could actually be a good opportunity um, with uh, digital jobs uh, in the Western Balkans, in a sense that um, if we are looking ahead and let's say big companies uh, further outsource digital jobs. And so you don't need actually to be um, physically on the ground within the company. So you can actually um, do your, jo your job for, from wherever, from the Balkans. And, and looking at uh, the rise uh, or the, um, the race for, for low wages. Um, so if the same job, if it's an accountant job or um, any other job, office job can be done from um, from outside the country, from outside Europe, uh, from, from somebody from the Western Balkans, and having in mind uh, the fairly uh, comparatively lower wages paying there, there's a good opportunity um, that this might, may increase and those kind of jobs that are currently um, executed in, in the EU could be outsourced to these uh, digital jobs in, in the Western Balkans. But having said this, um, at the same time, there's a competition because we're talking about at the global level, because uh, um, 
other people from uh, North Africa or Asia or whoever will also compete for, for the exact same jobs that might be these digital jobs that might be outsourced uh, for, uh, elsewhere. So in any case, what, what needs to be uh, maintained is um, keeping up with uh, the, the future needs, uh, labor market needs, not only looking what is needed in the Western Balkans or Europe, but uh, having even a more uh, global look at the types of jobs that will be available to educate people, educate the Balkan um, people uh, to make them fit to be a, um, um, competitive on, in, in that regard. But nevertheless, I mean, it's it's not only about education. One big aspect we have not talked about, but it needs to be stressed and stressed all over again. It's uh, education, human capital is a major factor, but at the same time, there are so many um, structural challenges that governments still need to tackle. Um, it's about, you, you talked about them as well. It's about the social security systems, health systems, also environmental standards, um, you know, in terms of for, for the well being of people. If it's also for, for businesses, I mean, we, we talked about this as well. We talked about that. Um, people um, tend to, to prefer um, going into the public sector because the, the salaries are better, the jobs are secured, but uh, there's a, a, a untapped potential for, for, for entrepreneurship. And I think still the, the business environment, the, the investment climate is not favorable enough to encourage also young people. I mean, this is where economy and economic development is striving um, from startups, young people, new ideas that innovations that brought up and still the, the, although there are efforts in place, but the business environment is still discouraging, rather discouraging young people than um, to, to go and, and start business and, and, and drive and with this enable um, economic development. Uh, I mean, do you, do you think that you can foresee, is it possible to foresee um, in, the, in the next few years? I mean, now that we've all, we're all working from home, I mean, if you've been working for the last whatever few years in in Germany or or or, or Austria or, or or Sweden for uh, you know for a good company and you're now working at home, is it not logical to then think, well, actually, if they want me to work at home for the next year, I might as well go and why would I be paying? To, to uh, uh, you know, uh, for a, a, a Swedish rent or a German uh, rent, when I could be um, earning the same amount of salary and go back to, to Belgrade or Trebinje or Sarajevo mm. or, or or Nixich and earn the, a vast amount of money for uh, I mean, not vast amount of money, vast amount of money comparative to a smaller, much much smaller um, mm. outgoings. I mean, is that something that we might see? A, you know, people coming back to who are already working for for big Western European com companies. Uh, yeah, I mean, right now we, we, we are kind of forced to, to do that. Many companies are forced to do that, and people went back home um, uh, to to uh, do the work from from their home offices, from their uh, country of origin, working for the international. So th the trend is a, a bit there. The question is how long it will maintain, because we already see the productivity levels are decreasing in, in the longer run. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure if that will be a really sustainable model uh, in the future. Um, okay. Right now it's, it's, it's forced. Maybe there will be some kind of hybrid format um, that will encourage um, teleworking uh, even more. On the other side, the question is where is your tax base? And yes. if your tax base is still with a Swedish or German company, um, then it's a, it's a huge loss for the Western Balkan uh, government. On the other side, of course, through consumption, etc., if you live um, um, temporarily back in, in, the, in the Balkans, you, you know, contribute as well in, 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 in different means, but it's... Okay, it's great. Well, fine. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, uh, so now I'm going to go to uh, uh, Miha. Um, specifically, that question seems to be tailored for you. Remittances decreased dramatically after 14 to 15 years of an immigrant leaving the country, presumably because they're having children and having to spend money on their children, not on sending it back to their brothers and sisters and parents. Is there any estimation around the Balkans where the Balkans is at this moment concerning remittances? Uh, the Balkans is uh, actually one of the highest receiving regions in the world. The average, uh, uh, the ratio of remittances to GDP is close to 10%. In uh, Bosnia, Albania, it is more than that. In 
Serbia, Montenegro, slightly less than that, in Kosovo, uh, 15% and so. Uh, but I would like to say that remittances are actually much more complex concept than, uh, you know, uh, a part of uh, saving from your current uh, wage that you send back home. It is more than that. And in that sense, they are stable actually, and they can be stable even without, uh, you know, uh, uh, counting only that part that is related to, to uh, what we usually consider remittances, and that is money that we send back home while we are elsewhere. No, it could be money that we bring home with us because we worked for a brief while, and this circu circular migration very much increases. As I said, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, uh, Czechia, even Poland are new destinations for that short-term work when people just get back what they make, uh, what they make with them home. That pensions are another stable part of something that is remittance in a sense. And then the finally, what also gets counted as remittances is uh, actually uh, residual of anything that the national banks cannot count as, uh, you know, uh, cannot ascribe to, I don't know, tourism or something else. So actually the, uh, the income of digital workers who do not get, uh, who do not get out of the country is also a remittance in the statistics of national banks. And this increases. So when you look at that, pensions are stable. Uh, the, the, uh, the income of digital workers, perhaps now due to COVID, might not be uh, uh, really as stable or as increasing and, and, and elsewhere. So they are also a, st a stable factor. What is not stable is actually what people bring with them and what they send. This is pro cycle. But overall, uh, in the longer term, I can, I do not see remittances decreasing because of a sort of maturity of, uh, of our stocks. Actually, our stock uh, of migrants in Western Europe is strongly decreasing uh, and our flows are increasing. And stock and flow in Central Europe is increasing. So it's the, the picture is much more complex than we usually, you know, if we re only reduce remittances to what people send uh, for to what migrants send to us. Great, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I've got a question, but I, I really, I'm not going to ask it because we are running out of time. And I think I'm going to uh, this round go to Edo now because um, because you this is your you know your next so. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate it, Tim. Um, I mean, I know we're, we're pressed for time, so maybe I'll just focus on, on one component of it, which is that we know what the main push and pull factors are in the region. And I just want to, us to take a moment to imagine if you were a migrant who left the region and are now living in Germany or France or wherever, the likelihood that you're gonna wanna come back to a region, unless we deal with some of the structural problems that we're talking about, is gonna be very low. Uh, there is, yes, huge amount of corruption, huge amount of nepotism. But then you look at other things. And again, I go back to the education healthcare components. If you have a family abroad now, why would you want to come back to an education system that is underperforming to where you are living now? Same with the health sector. Why would you want to now, as an older person, want to live in a place where the health sector is not as strong as it was? Andrea, for instance, she's, she's an inspiration. She's stayed in the region. And there are increasingly more people who are doing so. First, you need to make sure that all the people who stay behind, as I said to my earlier point, need to be as well educated as possible. We have some digitalization examples happening, and there are some digital hubs that are popping up here and there in Bosnia and Serbia, but they're a very low segment of acti economic activity at the moment. So you need to make sure that the rest of the people are also still uh, given the opportunities and skills to, to uh, have economic opportunities. But like for people like Andrea, as she ages, she's young now, but in the near future, she will need a, a, a stable healthcare system that will make sure that she's able to not only continue being a, a, a productivity, labor enhancing individual in the long term, uh, just so she can, as a human, stay healthy. Um, quite frankly, the healthcare systems currently uh, are not sufficiently doing that. And as a result, that actually has a real negative impact 
on the economic opportunities in, in the future because people's productivity is hurt as a result, their economic output is hurt, which means that economic convergence is continuing to be slowed down, which again, creates the economic conditions which will further push people out as well. So there is a circular component to it. Is if we don't invest in these social components, um, we fear that it could potentially exasperate some of the, the situations uh, that are there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's um, perfect timing. Uh, I'm afraid we have to come to an end uh, this panel. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much to all of the, my panelists and thank you very much to uh, attendees and uh, everybody who helped to um, organize this, especially Victoria Palm, who organized this particular um, uh, uh, panel. Uh, it's just fantastic that we're debating uh, all of this and, and, it, and it's really clear that there are more questions um, than answers. But I think that probably in the next couple of years, uh, we won't be debating like this anymore. Uh, in the sense that these are, we're, we've now realized that the scale of the problem. And I imagine that in the next few years that we'll be divided to talking in, in, in much greater detail about, about education, about um, automation, about uh, rural areas um, and so on and uh, so forth. But um, it's great, especially that the German presidency of the EU um, has recognized this as a problem and recognizing that it's a, there's a problem. I think this is what psychiatrists say is the um, first step to uh, dealing with it. So um, let's deal with it. Uh, thank you very much, and um, uh, we can now have um, some virtual food at the virtual lunch break, and um, to remind you, at two o'clock, uh, at least um, German time, spotlights on migration experiences, and at three o'clock, domestic reforms towards a better match of skills and labour market. So, uh, from London, uh, thank you very much, and goodbye to all of you. <laughs>